Mark Shanta, welcome to the Scottish Property Podcast. How are you today? Not too bad. Thanks for having me, Nick. How are you? Good, good. Unfortunately, we don't have Stephen. He's missing in action, so it's just myself and you, mate. But obviously, we go back a long way. I think we've known each other probably for about eight years now. And uh, do you remember the day that you met me? I, I remember it very well. We were both viewing a flat in Rosalie Drive in Dennis in one of the tenements. And you came up to me and we were like, all right, mate, how are you, going, how are you getting on? Um, I was like, I'm huh. just trying to picture And I was like, I've seen Nick at Views before. And um, I was like, ah, yeah, I've, I've seen him um, in the past, other ones, and then we just got chatting. And I think I said to you at, at the viewing, I said, do you fancy coming down to Hillfoot Street? Because I had one going on at the time there and having a look there. And then we just had got a good catch up and then stayed in touch ever since. Well, you, you know me, mate. I never miss an opportunity to, to network. So do you know what? I just talk to everybody, even on viewings. Most people just ignore me or just kind of like... <laughs> think that I'm a bit strange, but you just never know who you're going to meet. And obviously that's led to a pretty long uh, friendship and relationship. And obviously we've got a WhatsApp group going and all the rest of it, which uh, uh -huh. has been has been great. And it's, to be honest, mate, you've really kind of spurred me on in my own business and that. And obviously you took the lead um, as a letting agent. Uh, I think you're a couple of years ahead of me. And then I was like, wait a minute, if Mark Shanta can do it, I can do this as well. <laughs> yeah. So No, there's a lot to be said for that, for being that outgoing. Um, like just going up and speaking to people and at, at viewing, because I kind of take the, the same sort of view as you do. It's like there's more than enough for everybody to go around. So why is every, why when you're doing viewings, when you're looking at making offers, why is everybody always so candid? Like, go out there, just be yourself, and that's what you did. And then uh, here we are, eight years later, still talking about flats and Rosalie Drive and Hillfoot Street, and now on to lettings and sales and stuff like that. It's brilliant. Exactly. Well, we'll talk a little bit about Deniston and Ro Rosalie Drive and all that later on, because uh, I know you did well in that market. But let's just roll back the, the clock a little bit and put, you know, yourself into a bit of context and how you started out in property. But... You've got an interesting past, and I've heard you talk about in other podcasts before. You actually have got a past life as a professional poker player, so I'm quite interested in this, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people are. So just explain a little bit about how the hell you got into that and how that led you into property. Yeah, I'm sure you know more more than most people about it, but just really from back to the start, so. Um, it was never my goal to be a, a professional poker player. It's just something that I fell into. But we were, um, I'm from here originally. And I moved up to Glasgow when I was 17. Um, just came up to after school to do accounting finance at uni at Strathclyde University. So stayed in halls throughout that time, studied accounting finance, reasonable student, um, and ended up Get graduating from there um, and going to start a grad job at Deloitte, um, well, one of the big four accounting firms. And when I was doing that at, um, at Deloitte, there, there, was a, there was a bit of an online poker boom going on at the time. And I always found it quite fascinating. Like, like oh, the number, there's a lot of numbers behind poker. It's, it's, it's about figures, about percentages about playing against somebody. So it's not like a true form of gambling when you're essentially betting whatever on a football team you've got no control of in poker. You've got, there's loads of different aspects and the majority of them you control. So I always found that quite fascinating. And then um, I'd read up on it, I'd dabbled a wee bit, read up on it, read loads of books, read loads of forums. Um, and it start, I started to become quite good at it. I had one of my really good pals, um, he was playing professionally as well. We bounced ideas off each other. Um, and it got to the point where there was this, there was a, this market for online poker and it was something that I did in my spare time, weekends, after work, things like that. And I ended up, I was making more money playing poker than I was at my job. Um, and then I had my kind of first real big win was I won a tournament 
I won a satellite tournament, which takes you to a real tournament, a live tournament in America. It was the World Series of Poker. And I was, I was 21 at the time. And I went and played in this World Series of Poker. There were 7,000 entrants. I came 100 and, I think it was 106. But you got, for that, you got, I got $51,000. Wow. That's, that's a decent, that's a decent I know. Cash. I know. And I got knocked out of the tournament and I went up to the window, the window when you get knocked out and the woman behind the, the desk was that. I've never seen somebody so happy and smiling to be knocked out of a tournament. I was like, what, what do you mean? And she's like, normally everybody comes up out raging because they get knocked out. And I was like, well, I'm just happy because I've, I've won this money. And then, but to put it into context, first prize on that tournament was seven million. Oof. I know. And we came, I came 106 and got 51,000. So you need to pay tax on that. No, um, oh, because it's, um, you're no, you don't pay tax on any gambling income in, in the United Kingdom. You do if you're an American um, citizen. So I came home with that money. Do you um, come home like through the airport with a big no. suitcase of cash? <laughs> oh, they, they cut you a cashier's check. They give you cash. They do it. They say how much you want cash, how much you want check. So I took a bit, had a nice uh, meal and night out and stuff, and then I got the next flight home because the tournament had gone on so long, I'd actually missed my flight. I had to delay my flight because the tournament actually takes up to two weeks. So I was in day eight of the tournament and my flight was meant to be right. like six or something like that. So do you have, did you have like um, support from your family, like your, your parents and all that, or were they, were they like that, mate? You, you know, not me. <laughs> Son, well, you need to get a real job here. Well, that is a, that is um, that is kind of the the next part. So when I came back with the money, what I did was I actually put came back, had a bit of student debt or whatever, cleared the debt, um, came back, and then I had the the converted to sterling, whatever it was, and instead of going and buying a watch or going and buying clothes or fancy car or like whatever. Um, I put that, I put a, a bit of that money back into the poker. So I deposited it onto the site. And then that's when I started to build my bankroll. And that's when I started to play and started to read more and get really good at it. So it became a point after about, I think I was in it to wait for about six months where I phoned my mum and dad and I was like that. Ah, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go professional at this. There's a good opportunity for me to make a lot, a lot of money at this. Um, and they could not be more supportive. And they were like that, great, we back you in whatever you're doing. But that's what they're like. They're just, that's they're just phenomenal parents. They've always got it back. And I mean, you could take a, a different view on it if you're a parent. So you could be like, we've just paid this we've just paid our son's digs through, you know, giving him money every week. And he's got his degree, he's got his job, and now he's going to chuck it away. But there was not one bit, one bit of negativity. They were like, yep, go for it. Um, I was with Gail, my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, we've been married for 10 years now. She was supportive of it, her family was supportive of it, and it was just like that. So went into the partner's office with my resignation letter. <laughs> He's like, ah, you're going to do what? I was like, I'm going to go and play professional poker. Had you, but, been, had you been keeping this quite secret, uh, sort of aside from your work, or did your work colleagues know about you doing this? Well, they knew about it. People were following it when it was right. going on. It's like, I remember back at the time, and some of your podcast audience might never even heard of it, but back at the time, there was something called Bebo. And Bebo was an <laughs> and I did a blog on Bebo of updates about how the days were going and people were following it and commenting and things like that. But I think Bebo shut down, so I couldn't even go back and find it anymore. That's a shame. I remember Bebo, Bebo MySpace. That was one of the other thing. I changed days. So so obviously, like, I mean, in my mind, right? You know, gambling, I just think kind of you know, quite kind of people that have got problems and it's dangerous and yeah. people that have lose money and it becomes an addiction and then it's a slippery path. You know, did you ever kind of think that you were, you know, was there ever any point 
where you thought, wait a minute, hang on a minute, you know, uh, maybe you had a big loss or maybe you were getting too obsessed with it, or how did it go for you? There is, obviously, there's a stigma attached. There is a stigma attached to gambling. Like, people, like, people have gone through some terrible situations with it. I, um, but my view at the time, and, and it still is, that I don't see poker as gambling. I, I see it as, I see it as an, a sport almost it's like because you're although you're betting on probabilities you're you're in control of that like if you go yeah. and stick on money on a horse you've got no control on it um whereas with poker it's different because you control you can come in and out of games anytime you you want to as well so yeah um the the next kind of step from that was deposit come back and on on and depositing that money online and um that's when I started, and I, I played. I, I played professionally for seven years. That was my. That was poker was my my sole income for those seven years. That I played from twenty one until twenty eight. And what does that lifestyle look like then? I think you've. I've heard you say before you were up like staring at a screen long, long hours. Yeah, uh, it's um, it's what you make it. That lifestyle, like people, I'm sure th- there might be people out there thinking, right, professional poker player, he's in at the casino. Uh, but I don't think I've. I think I've been to a casino in Glasgow once. Um, mm-hmm. But the actual day to day life, I treated it a very disciplined. Uh, I, I treated it like a job. So I would get up with Gail, um, and w- I would work. I, well, I call it work. I don't know play maybe. Um, nine to five. I'd take right. a break, go to the gym, go for a walk, go for a run, whatever it was. Um, and I would play online and play up to six screens at a time. Um, and that was my jobs. And it, it, it allowed me and it gave me a great base to kind of start um, life with. Um, and I, I'm not saying that it's, I'm set for life or anything like that, but it certainly set me up. Um, and it was a calculated decision. There is loads and loads. I had some amazing experiences, amazing times. Like, I, I, I think I've been to Vegas playing tournaments about 15 times, Australia a couple of times, um, the Caribbean a couple of times. I played a tournament underwater at the Caribbean. I had to go and take scuba lessons. And we got a boat out into the middle of the sea in St. Kitts and we took we all scuba dived to the bottom of the, the ocean. We set up like a table with stones uh, and stone um, cards as well when we played the tournament. It was all filmed and stuff. So I had some amazing experiences. Um, the downside of it was one the, the the I guess the kind of lack of social interaction at your workplace because you didn't there was no interaction with work and made up for it through friends through property through family that side of things through football um, but if you were an insure guy with not a, a or girl with not a lot around you. I can see it, it, it wouldn't be a very healthy lifestyle. Um, and then the second downside is you're you're not really building anything because all you're doing is you're playing for chips and you're playing for money and your job satisfaction came from either winning or losing and, and that was that. Okay, so, you, so you're making this money playing poker over seven years. I mean, I'm presuming that you just didn't, you know, knowing the type of guy that you are, you know, you're, when I met you, you you weren't obviously driving about in a flash car and all the rest of it. So I'm presuming that money was going somewhere. Were you filtering that into properties at the time? Or? Yeah. So how did the property stuff start for you? So that is exactly, yeah, so that's how I got into property was from, um, was fr- from, earning, from earning the money at poker. What I did was I would save up for a deposit and I would use that deposit to buy a, a buy to let flat. And my very, very first, this is mental how much the industry has changed when you come to think about it. My very, very first flat that I bought, I self certified the mortgage as a professional gambler. Really? Like, and it was a 95%. Hello, hiya. So that's uh, Monty the dogs are about to get walked. So, <laughs> is that your dog walker? <laughs> uh, so, um, 
Yeah. So I use yeah, Mark Shanta, the master of outsourcing, he even outsources his dog walking. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. It's, uh, it's pouring as well. Thank you. Um, so, first flat I bought was in Finlay Drive and self certified the mortgage. What year was that? I'm getting roughly. I think it was 2000. And, I think it was 2008. Right. right around crash time. Maybe 2009. I mean, it didn't it didn't perform particularly well. We we don't have it anymore. We sold it. Um, it didn't perform particularly well. But first flat I bought was in Finlay Drive. Self certified the mortgage as well. And as a professional gambler, it's just like now mortgages have gone that complete other way. It's like you know we would have no chance of getting a more any form of mortgage with that. So. What my strategy was, was play poker for a, some, a period of time, earn enough for a deposit, buy a property, um, do, do it up, um, uh, rent it out, move on to the next one. Um, we didn't pull out the funds or anything like that because we, did, we didn't need to, I say we because it was myself and my wife, Gail, but we didn't need to release, we didn't need to do money in, money out or anything like that because we were, there was another deposit coming um, down the line. So that was a strategy and kind of fast forwards seven years, what we had done, we built up, we had, um, we bought two a year, it worked out exactly. So we bought 14 um, buy to lets in that time period. And it was all, they were all, all in personal names, all joint with myself and Gail. And, and that's how we ended up getting around, getting the mortgages as restrictions got tougher. We were able to use Gail's salary. She we, had a steady income, full time. She you, did exactly. Get employed, right? Okay, that's so, that, no, that's really interesting though, because I'm thinking timelines here, and obviously you started just about when the crash happened, and then obviously, you know, I think you've obviously timed it quite lucky in terms of during your buying time of buying two a year, you're pretty much buying when things are were pretty low then. Yeah, they, and it was true. And it, they're definitely, definitely an element of luck to it and to the timing because I was quite uneducated at the time. I was just like, right, I know Deniston because I stayed there when I was a student and we live there now. So let's buy around Deniston. The, num the numbers seem to work there. And we bought the first flat I bought was Finlay Drive and we bought Craig Park Drive. Rosalie Drive, Hillfoot Street, Arc Lane, these little pockets in Deniston, and they've just performed phenomenally over the last 10 years. But then the flip side to that was we made a kind of educated guess that we thought, well, you know, Deniston's quite a good demographic. It's a mile from town. It's going to perform well, continue to perform well. And why don't we look south? And so we looked at Tradeston, thought that would perform well, and it just never has. It's just... We bought a flat in Oxford Street for a hundred, and then we sold it maybe seven or eight, seven years later for the exact same. So it just right. never had that growth. And how were you kind of educating yourself, or how did you kind of, you know, what kind of spurred you on at the start? Because obviously, like a lot of people now, they come across something on Facebook or YouTube, but we didn't really have that back then. So <laughs> was it? Is it somebody that you knew that had done this? Did you have a friend who invested in property or something? No, not really. I guess it was just kind of reading up on things, um, reading up and doing your own due diligence, meeting people like obviously like yourself. Like met you and you're like you're like what are you doing? I was like well what what are you what are you doing? What's the you uh, know? And that that's the way it was done. There was so there was a lot less content back then, and. And it was just, yeah, it was just kind of meeting, just just kind of meeting different people and making your own kind of judgments on it. Cool. Good. Um, so obviously you built up that portfolio. That that did pretty well, obviously, because you you invested in really kind of great locations that that boomed over that time, such as Deniston and all the rest of it. Um, you were still doing the poker at this time. What was it that that eventually what was that? Can you remember that point where you decided, wait a minute here, I don't want to do this poker professional uh -huh. poker playing anymore? Yeah. 
I, I remember it. Well, actually, it's like <laughs> I would. <laughs> The, throughout the time of playing, there was ups and there was downs, but I've, I've always been quite a, a level-headed and sort of calm person. Never really let it affect me too much or anything like that. And it, yeah, it was just we were. I just kind of viewed it as the longer term. And I remember, I, I remember it. We were living in Giffnock at, at the time, and. Things just hadn't been going that great, and I was just like, "Do you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I want to go and I want to build something else and, and do something else." So, as you do, you you speak to your wife and um, speak to Gail, who's supportive as always, and phone, phone your mum. So, phone mum. She's like, "I'll come up and we'll have a chat, and we'll take the dog for a walk." And mm-hmm. um, she came up and we had a walk and. I talk and I was like, I, I'm not going to do this anymore, Mum. She's like, good, get out while you can. Everything's going great. And I was like, well, what do I do now? Because essentially you're seven years, no no qualifications, you've got a degree. And, mm. But we had this portfolio of 14 rental flats. Um, and I was like, I enjoy that. I enjoy the aspect of getting them um, turned around, Meeting tenants, doing viewings, do, organizing maintenance, meeting the people, and I like property and people are two things that I enjoy and two things that I like, and I think it's important to do something that you like. And we just kind of came up with the idea: why don't along with your own stuff start managing stuff for other people? Um, and that was the idea, and that so I said, right, okay, well, we're going to set up a letting agency. Um, and my first client was another professional poker player. <laughs> Is it, right, okay. He, he bought three properties um, that we sourced for him. This is before sourcing, I think, was a big yeah. thing. We found the properties for him, did them up, rented them out. Um, my second client was another poker player. Okay. And then it, it just, we, st- we cold started the agency from my stuff. And a few for others, and then just built it from there. Um, and it started off, and we started off in my office at home. And then the next step was just kind of gradual steps of, after that. Yeah. Then, so obviously, like, I, yeah. Fast forwarding to just now, uh, Mark owns Shanta Residential, which is a well established now uh, lettings and sales agency in the south side of Glasgow. Um, and you know you've got your own premises, and I'm quite jealous of you because like you've got all this staff, and I'm still at the kind of point where I'm doing everything myself. So, fuck you. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> um, no, I mean you've you've done incredibly well, and like you know part of my questions, obviously, we're going to lead on to you know what it takes to become a successful letting agent and sales agent. But you obviously entered the industry when there was a huge amount of change. Uh, PRT, uh, safety legislation and all the rest of it. Um, do you think that was actually quite a good thing, you know, to get in at that point? Or, well, uh... See, when I entered, there was absolutely no barriers to entry at all to set up a lighting agency. All oh, right, okay. So, yeah, there was none. Um, so, we, so we set up in 2000 and at the start of 2016 and there was none. So you'll know this as well. It's like, I said, right, I'm going to set up a letting agency. No, no training. Um, no experience. And we, we got our logo off. We got our logo off Fiverr.com. And, and that was it. Like, there was nothing to stop you from, from stop anybody from being a letting agent. Now everything's changed, which is, which to answer your question is a really, really good thing because mm. you never need to be a, to be a decision maker in the business, you now need to be a registered lighting agent. You have to go through training. You have to um, like understand and know the lighting agent code of practice, the, the private residential tenancy and, and all that. So I got in before that right. happened. And then when they brought it out, we obviously did the things that you need to do to get registered. Cool. So like how many units you imagine now in terms of the lettings? We've got about... I need to double check about 260, I think, off okay. the top of my head. Um, and 
Yeah. So that, that's been great growth, obviously, over how many years now you've been going? About four and a half. It was May in 2016, so four and a half. Fantastic. And, and obviously, you know, you've built it to a successful point. You've got a really good reputation. I mean, anytime you go on Facebook forums and somebody asks for a let page and it's always yourself that pops up. So what does it take to be a good letting agent then just give me a few key points um i think there's a few key points uh, a few key things number one is to be fair no matter what be fair two never ever lie never that that's the one thing i, I say to anybody starting with us you never lie see if you make if you make an arse of something now, you mess something up, you put, you're only human, you put your hands up and you say, I've made a mess of this. And it's happened to me loads of times, but people respect if you're transparent enough to say, I'm sorry, I'm, I, made, I made a mess of that. And like, you know, like sometimes you, it shouldn't happen, but sometimes you book out viewings, you don't add it to the calendar correctly and somebody's turned up to do a viewing phone's office raging and instead of saying or making up an excuse for it you say I'm really really sorry what can we do to make it better so number two thing yeah always be open always be transparent I would say the other thing is to try and put yourself into whether it be the tenant landlord's shoes as well and um, Sometimes people react differently, especially when there's money involved and you can have a great relationship with somebody for three or four years and it can go overnight when money gets involved. And I think you have to try and understand where all parties are coming from. Um, I would say number three is to be decisive as well. Make your decision. You, you have to make a decision as a team or as an in, individual and back yourself and stick and, and stick with it and just say look this is because there's a lot of gray areas as you know there's loads of things that are it can go one way or the other you know a lot and, of things are subjective as well you know what might yeah, be one yeah. person's problem is not another person's problem so you need to make like you say making judgment calls and decisions is really important i agree and that, that's what i kind of feel quite fortunate in the way that we are set up because Gail's, my wife Gail, she's a director of the business as well and although she works three days a week because of childcare and it's, she's a, a brilliant sounding board for everything and it helps to just be able to say look, this is a, a subjective area, grey area whatever you want to term it, what do you think? Like, help like, mm -hmm. and it's just once you decide that, once you bring up all the facts, just making the call on it, and then. Do you not find that sometimes in this job we're like trying to be like you're trying to be like a psychologist <laughs> almost, like you? you it's, oh, it's yeah, it is. You've got to be a letting agent. You have got to enjoy the job. You've got to enjoy the process. You've got to enjoy problem different, solving, different different walks of life as well, and you've. Yeah, you've got to because otherwise you would just you would turn up with the wrong attitude to work. You'd just turn up and be like that. Ah, well, I'm getting bothered because of this, that, and other thing, and it, it wouldn't be a happy place for you to work. I think it's um, it definitely takes a certain type of character, and I would say that as well for the people that are listening that are thinking about self managing their their own properties as well. You need to have a certain type of character because I yeah. can't be doing with this type of mentality it's us against them, you know, it's the landlord versus the tenant. Yeah. I don't, I, I totally disagree with that whole whole thing. And you see it pop up again and again on forums, how, you know, the tenants are just the kind of, the shite at the bottom of the pile. And it's good, it's good enough for a rental or, or you know, this te or the tenants, you know, nightmare. You're always going to have problems with tenants. They've always been a nightmare. No, like they are, there are good customers as well, you know? Exactly. No, I, you're spot on, but I think, yeah, you're spot on. It's like, I would say that about we've got positive relationships with about 95% of tenants and about 95% of landlords. And the other 5% have been 
the disagreements and from each other not being able to see each other's point of the other side's point of view and, and that's fine because it, but it doesn't make them the bottom of the pile whether it be landlords or tenants it, it means they just don't disagree with yeah. what our judgment is on, on our yeah. point of view. I think sometimes, obviously, there's got to be compromises and there's got to be, like, you've got to draw the line somewhere and you're not going to pander to every request as well from the tenant because, you know, obviously, ultimately, you're serving uh, your client who is the landlord too. So, but you need, like you said, at the right at the start, you need to see it from both sides. I think that's... 100%. It. And you're, um, the reason why I think you're a, a good letting agent is... You do that, and you've got particularly thick skin as well. You're you're just like that. Well, you know, if they're having a go at me and they're saying that that's not good enough, then I think it's a fantastic. Yeah, I think it's fantastic with all the new uh, letting agent code of conduct and all the regulations. I think it's brilliant because it takes away the kind of a lot of the grey area, and it makes it easier for us to follow procedures. And as long as we've done this, that, and the next thing, and we've done all we can then obviously there's only so much you can do. And then, you know, as long as you've done your bit, then hopefully you don't get into trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you think, what do you, you know, loads of people want to get involved in property, right? But they always just see the kind of, the end result. And a lot of people might not necessarily be willing to put in the hard sort of yards at the start and the hard work. Um, you know, there's a common theme that, that I see developing in uh, people who are either estate agents and letting agents. A lot of them seem to be quite successful property investors them, themselves. So what about seeing that as a route into property for young people? Do you see that as a kind of decent way? And, and what, what do you mean? So getting involved in property first? So, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they're wanting to be the successful property investor but they want to just fast forward to the, the kind of riches, but a lot of them don't even have money to put down on their first deposit or anything like that. Do you think that almost a career or experience in, in lettings and sales can could be a good could good good, good ground, grounding? Yeah, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, it's like any experience, letting sales, property, when you're going out and seeing different properties, you're meeting different tenants, you're seeing different locations, then it's a good thing. But what I'm just thinking when you're saying that is there's obviously different paths and neither of you or I went down the corporate path and that is quite that is quite a, a normal way to get into the industry to set up your own lens as a sales agency. It's like you come from one of the big you go you go in as a trainee, you work your way up to letting agent negotiator, manager, then you might be area manager, and then you're like, I can go and sit. I'll go set up myself. So that's quite common that, that that people will set up in that way. And they come with tons of experience. They come with loads and loads of different ways of operating systems. They've got CRM knowledge, various things like that. And But it's interesting that when, I mean, when we've hired, and I know like, we've discussed this just privately as well about staff and things like that. When we've hired, we've, never hired somebody coming from a different agency. We, we've always hired based on skills um, and based on the person and that we can, that we see that we can kind of mold them to operate in the way that our business wants to operate, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I just think that, that just get yourself out there. If you're, I'm just thinking if you're a young person, uh -huh. Say you've got somebody and you've got like a load of savings and you've got a load of cash and obviously it's not really something for you. You can get straight in there. But if you're just out of college or something like that and you want to learn, you know, without having to pay thousands of pounds to go on a course, or you want to be about people that are profit investors or that, okay, you need to deal with a fair amount of shit from tenants and all the rest of it mm -hmm. and people complaining at you. But getting out there and especially in the sales as well, I think that, you're building relationships with people. You're getting used to dealing with different sorts, types of people. You're building your network. You're understanding how the process works. You're meeting surveyors, possibly. You're speaking to surveyors. You're, you know, that sort of thing, I think. And eventually, um, as you may know, you know, deals can come to you. Like, 
off market deals, for example. Yeah. Um, if you're building relationships, then you've potentially got investors. I'm just thinking about something to give the younger listeners there. Yeah, I well, agree. So I think that, yes, if you want to go and be a professional property developer or investor, then working within the industry, it can only help. And, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't think if you, I don't think at an early stage that being just a developer or just an investor, it would fill your, it would fill your day enough. Like you would be left underutilized because you can't go to eight viewings a day mm-hmm. and study eight home reports a day without eventually burning out. I think if you're thinking about getting into the industry and you're wanting to go down and to be a developer or build your vital portfolio, then working in the industry, I agree. Yeah, yeah that, to me, that seems like a no-brainer. Cool. Um, so I think you and me could go on about, you know, talking about letting agents, you know, building a business, letting agency, and, you know, you're also doing sales as well. So let's talk a little bit about how do you find that, doing the, the, the being an estate agent? And, and, you know, what kind of, what the, you know, there's plus and negatives of, of both, but I think I've spoken to you before and you said you still prefer the, the letting side of things. Is that still the case? But obviously, well, like, the money seems better on the state agency, so. It, it does, it's like, the, the two businesses work hand in hand absolutely perfectly because, you know, letting agents say, in terms of income, it's very, very steady. It's like one of the few professions I know that's like your clients are almost on. As long as you have their property rented out, your clients or your landlords, they're on a retainer because they pay you commission off the rent. So, yeah. I mean, nobody will be able to see me doing my hand with the graph if it's a podcast, but it's like a straight, steady line. Whereas a state agency income is very cyclical. It's very up and down, up and down. And things... Things are great this month. For us, we've had the record number of completions this month because- How in many? The period, well, I'm not <laughs> in, in the period- <laughs> I can find out, mate. I'll go on my right move yeah, well, uh, just, plus account and I'll find out. <laughs> but in the, in the period of June and July, when we've come out of lockdown, there was a massive, massive big boom and you're taking on so many, so many um, new instructions and it, there's so much activity, everything was sell and sell well at closing dates. Three months down the line, it's November, everything's completing. But the reality is now it, we're in November, things are really, really quiet, whether it be market forces coming towards the end of this year, um, it always quiets down towards the end of the year. By to let pro, uh, sorry, mortgage products are getting pulled, they're taking longer to complete. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about people out there, whether or not they're even allowed to do viewings, which they are, but there, some people may not want to, some people may be in isolating. So the market now in Dece- November, December is really quiet. So when it comes around to March time, February, March, our income is going to be down. So it's yeah. up and down, up and down. And I, I don't think I would like to be just an estate agent without the lettings unless I had a really, really strong foothold in the local area. Unless we were one of the, like, you know, you, you, you almost, to use a kind of Americanism, dominate your your patch and it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter what month it is, you're going to have tons and tons of listings. And yeah. that may come, that will, that's a goal of ours to come, but it's not the case now. I, I, to be honest with you, know this already, but I struggled with the state agency thing. I, I took out a six month right move subscription and I talk, I've talked about this in the past, but it wasn't within my personality to go into like a shit property and talk it up, you know, and, and make it but basically polish a turd. Like I find that very difficult and I'm too honest. Well, that's me, that's me, basically. That, that's me, yeah, basically that's me. And uh, like, I know you've got a system probably where you've got people who, who are doing it. So maybe, you know, your advice might be, you know, maybe you can find somebody who can do that sales job better yeah. almost. I, I do a lot, I do a lot of valuations myself and do you? like, like, my kind of strategy is I don't 
build up your unrealistic expectation ever. I, I never time. do. And I don't say, like, if I was going to value a property today, I wouldn't say to them, yeah, no bother. Your home report's going to come in at this and it's going to sell at a closing date. That's and, just setting you up for failure, isn't it? It yeah. is. And you're, you're setting yourself up for an, an unhappy client down the line. And just because you, you might win the business because you fed them all of this stuff at the start, but it, down the line, they're not going to be happy. And I, I, I'm kind of similar, maybe maybe a bit less than really, really calling a spade a spade, but I, I'll be honest with the expectations. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I, I'm certain that I've lost valuations because I've not been um, all singing and all dancing when I don't think it's appropriate. No, I like I like your approach. I like your approach definitely. Um, so let's just talk about right. Let's get your investor hat back on, yeah. and let's talk about like what you're doing at the moment. Uh, you know, put the lettings and the sales business aside. And I know you basically sat out of the market for a while because you were so focused on building the business, but you wanted to put everything into that and it's obviously paid off. But you've recently just sort of come back in uh, and you're investing again. So tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, so yeah, you're right in what you're saying. It's like for the last three or four years, the sole direction, my sole focus is building up the letting, the sales and everything's into that. Um, and it's always taken me this amount of time, like the last four and a half years, to get into a place where I feel like we're fully systematized, we're fully staffed and operational, where I can sit at home now and happily chat away to you. Yeah. Chat away, like, go and have, like, I can sit and... But you've I'm still not, not got enough time to walk your own dog. That's disgraceful, mate. It'd take me an hour to dry off after it. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like I've got I've I've got a bit more time back now. Don't get me wrong, the number one focus is always, always going to continue to build up the, the business, but I've got a bit of time back now. And what we've done this year is myself and a partner of mine. I know it's like a partner seems like a really a really unfair and strong word because he's like, you know, really, really good. Pal of mine, and then, this is your business partner, right? Not your life partner. partner. So, just, in, yeah, just in case people partner. are get, just in so, case people are confused that maybe I, Gail's off the scene now. And you've got a new <laughs> partner, <laughs> and it's a he. <laughs> yeah, business partner, stroke best pal. Like yeah. we, we talk, like, and he is plumbing and heating engineer, so he's got a really, really strong, good skill set. He's amazing at his own job and. We kind of came up with the idea that why don't we pull resources like because you know we obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of trust in between us and we're great pals and all the rest of it but our skill sets match where we we've got a letting agency we've got a sales agency we know how to find the properties we um we know what an end result of a development looks good at and he, Ross, does this day in, day out, and he's got a real good attention for detail. He knows what he knows at the end result, what he wants property to look like, and we just work well together. So we can Sounds like with... a perfect relationship, mate. Sounds like a perfect JV. So perfect you put, JV. Yeah. <laughs> you put a, you put you put a post on the Scottish Property Podcast group like just last week or something. It's one of the most like engaged posts we've ever had. It had like 120 likes or something like that. Um, you know, loads of people commented on it. Really, really nice refurb. So just, you know, it'd be probably useful for the listeners and they can go back and check that in the Facebook group. But just give us a brief, can you give us a wee breakdown of the numbers? Because I think it will inspire people that yeah. there's still deals to be had out there, you know? So, how did you how did you come across the property to start with? Well, actually, this one is a funny one. It's in the owner of that property. So the property is in Clarkson Road, and it's round the corner from our shop, like five minutes walk. And um, the owner of the property walked into our shop, and he said, "I would sell her. I would sell my flat quickly. Do you have anybody? Do you know anybody who'd buy it?" I wasn't in. Um, I was probably walking the dog. 
<laughs> the dog walker had a day off. <laughs> no, I wasn't. And then Katie, who's our sales manager, she said, "Oh, uh, Mark would, Mark would look at that." Um, and she sent me up an appointment. So I went out to see it, and I said to him, "Look, if I was valuing this house to sell, we would be like, we would value it at um, X amount, and the home report would come in at X amount." Um, and then I offered him. I said, "Look, but we we." If you wanted, we could we could buy this for. So I, I don't mind saying now, but the home report would have come in at fifty, and we said, oh, if you wanted, we could buy it for forty-five, and we could complete within three or four weeks. And um, it's up to you because, like, because we can do one or that other. And he said, yeah, that's great, just do that. And I think we completed it in two and a half weeks. We bought the property, um, and we. We spent, we spent about 20, we needed everything done to it. So it needed windows. We needed to change it from a studio to a one bedroom by, by creating an internal kitchen off the double recess. Needed a heating system, there was no gas in it. Um, it needed bathroom, kitchen, everything plastered, painted, all the rest of it and uh, rewired. So we spent about 20 on it. Um, and I think like, we, we sold one in the block prior for, around about, I think it was 90. So I think when it comes to revalue, I think it'll come in at 95, maybe maybe 100 in a good day. So we'll be able to pull our money, we'll be able to pull all of our money back out. Perfect. And obviously you did a post on that on the Facebook group, so people can go and check it out. But um, I think there's a few things to take away. First of all, all the people who are complaining that there's no deals about, obviously we appreciate it is a tough market, right? We know that. But there are still people out there that are wanting like quick sales or there is yeah. the occasional off-market property that comes up. And I think I really like what you said about, you were fully upfront with the guy in terms of you said, look, you could get this, you know, or, or it would value at that, but this is what, if you want a quick solution, I think that's really key when you're dealing with the, um, the off-market stuff and the direct to vendor, because you could easily uh, start, getting a bad reputation and you've got too much to lose. Yeah, hundred percent. And the other thing was the we got a home report done on the property as well. And um, well he independently got a home report done. And yeah. the home report came in just what I had valued it at. So I said look, I value it at 50. And he got a home report and that home report through his contact came in at 50 and he had the facts in front of him where he could either sell it through us or a different agent on the market or um, accept less than the home report value and for a quick sale. And I, I guess that is, yeah, that basically that there is those sort of deals. Obviously there's an element of luck involved in that, yeah. but I think you make your own luck. And yeah, it's not, it's not every week, you know, somebody walks into your shop and says that. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's happened once in four years. <laughs> <laughs> and I've told your staff the next time somebody comes in like that to give me a call. So <laughs> is that you dropped off the brown envelope into the office? <laughs> totally, totally. 100%. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's quite inspiring seeing posts like that um, from people who are still doing deals. Um, and it sounds like a great partnership with your mate as well. But obviously, like, I think you've got so much trust there from... It's a relationship that's been built up over what, years, yeah. 30 years. Do you know what I mean? So that's, again, a thing that we put down people's uh, throats on the podcast all the time. If you're going to get involved in some sort of joint venture, then make sure it's the right person. You've done all your checks, you know? Or... I think in a partner, like partnerships for everything is, you know, partnerships for anything that you do in this industry, that, they're worthwhile doing and they're worthwhile investigating because obviously like you are what, what you're doing with Stephen you guys have got a brilliant partnership on the podcast and that, whether would that work as well if it was just if it was just you or just Stephen I don't know he's fucking let me down today <laughs> hasn't he <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is true, actually. We've, we've done we've nearly got to a full year of podcasts and you better have a good excuse I'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know. Um, yeah, partnerships are, are key. Whether I think it's been in your own 
in your own workplace, like, you know, you bouncing, bounce, bounce things yeah. off your partner, whether it be your wife, your friend, even you know, people that are invested in you and you, you, you trust in. So yeah. I, I think it's more than that. But I think, again, I do think a key part of it, as you were saying, is you don't just go into partnership with somebody that you don't know that says that they mm. can come up with half the cash. I think that's where we've seen over the years it turn into a disaster. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't get me started on that. That as well as people just popping up left, right and centre on your Instagram or your LinkedIn and then just disappearing. So, but we won't go down that route because that's quite yeah. that's quite negative. We keep it positive and we'll end on a positive note. So what are your goals, your strategy, you know, personal? And when I say personal, I don't mean like your family life, then. I mean like your, your personal personal investing and your business where do you see yourself in five years' time? Pick um, on the spot. <laughs> no, um, number one focus and number one goal is to build the business. I continue to build the business and build it well. And I'm not say there's we don't have lofty ambitions to be the number one, like the next corporate agency or like the biggest agency in Glasgow or anything like that. We want to build it a manageable rate and continue to keep our own high standards and continue to keep our good reputation and that's the number one goal without a doubt same with the sales is to build and develop in our wee pocket in the south side of glasgow and become we're getting there like yeah. we are getting there no i love that how you have you know sort of geo focused your attention on that that kind of south side area i love that because even you know, you've taken full advantage of, for example, like local community groups and stuff like that, who now you've got such a good name locally, you'll get a mention way over any of the big corporates. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I hope so. Like, genuinely, I don't, that is just genuinely people who we, we've done business with. And it is, it's a nice compliment, that, that's for sure. And um, But that is part of our, our strategy is to continue yeah. to build up in our area and and um, who knows may, maybe a second office one day I don't know it's not it's not in a it's not in a it's not in a business plan or anything like that so that would be the business goal just focus on that and um, Ross and I we, we've done three flats this year the buy renovate refinance we, we would like to have another we would like to have 20 before we're 40 so I'm 36 so if you're going to stick with that partnership, then it's working well with 100%. yourself. Oh, and that's investing in limited company now, is it? Yeah, in it together. 100%. Right. Cool, cool. And and just like just a question that sprung in my mind. I mean, during this whole coronavirus and COVID and all that, you know, I'm looking at you thinking, geez, oh my, Mark Shant is just cruising through this without, you know, doesn't seem to be any problems. It's, has there been any kind of real tough times in business as general, just for other people that are in business who have been going through a hard time lately. Have you kind of hit any real challenges? And or is it, you know, our industry, yeah. to be fair, has not really been hugely affected, has it? Yeah. Um, challenges. Um, Just for business. Yeah, in yeah I mean, no, nothing, nothing, nothing major. Nothing major. Like we've had a few, we've had a few lights where we've tenants have, Tenants have moved in and moved out within a few months. Um, we had quite a lot of tenants move out prematurely when they found out they could do their course up in um, up in Nab. Like they're from Aberdeen and they, they go to Glasgow Uni, but they can do their course online. And we had a lot of tenants who were like that. Well, yeah. no, don't, don't need to pay for a flat in Glasgow. And then it becomes just like the kind of grey area that we were talking about. It's like, uh, we just did it. We just did let this property out for the landlord two months ago. Um, all this work to get it reset back up, new marketing fee and new inventory and all, all, all checkout report and all the rest of it, it's not our fault. We didn't reference the tenant poorly. It's just the circumstance and situation. And it's like, at that point, you have to use your, you have to look at it and make your judgment. And we, a few sales this year, they hadn't gone to plan a, a couple of, you know, you can't have a hundred percent record, but a couple yeah. have gone to different agents and that, as far as challenges, 
that's been like that tenant. I mean, yeah, that along with tenants, um, tenants struggling, struggling to pay rent, and as part of the yeah, like various tenants losing their jobs and stuff, and being the the middle person in that discussion with the landlord and explaining what well, they're in their arrears, can we arrange a repayment plan? Um, that I guess that's been quite challenging, especially because landlords go mortgages to pay as well, and sometimes, sometimes it's not affordable for them for tenants not to be able to pay either. Um, so that would be it. What, what about yourself? Um, I would say that obviously, you know, the viewings when we come into lockdowns and things like that. You know, getting out to do viewings. Obviously, you don't. You want to make sure everybody's safe and stuff like that. So managing existing tenants who are have handed in their notice and stuff like that that can be quite tricky sometimes because they don't want you to go into their flats and then that can mean that the properties take longer to let but again it's all about getting people on side and managing i think if you're a corporate agent and you're just hitting out these emails basically saying you know this is what we're doing here and you're not really giving the tenant the feeling like they're in control then yeah. they're going to ultimately put up a blockage and they're not they're, they're automatically just going to go against you and i think that's what happens a lot of the time that's where people say oh my tenants are a nightmare i think it's about like the agent managing it like i get on really well with my tenants i try and understand it all the time from their point i use whatsapp like voice messages as well i think sometimes with voice you can get your your um you know you can get empathy across using voice whereas an email can be quite cold sometimes so it's about getting the tenants on side and most of my tenants are allowing me even at the moment when we're in uh, severe restrictions in, lo- in tier four of lockdown they're still allowing me to go in and do viewings so yeah i think it's about overcoming that that's it mate um lastly to finish off uh where can people get you? Do you want to just give us your details, website, email? Yeah, uh, it's just Mark Shanta. Um, imaginatively named uh, Business of Shanta Residential, if any of the... And it's Mark Shanta. Um, we're on, um, we've got Shanta Residential Facebook. It's Mark at Shanta Residential email, .co.uk. Um, and yeah. you're getting you're getting better at the Instagram. I've got to say, you're starting <laughs> to put on your uh, your projects and stuff like it's that. Still not my, like, I've still never done one where it's um, the video. You know, like, I'm talking to one. Of the, yeah, exactly. Uh, I've never <laughs> done one of them, but yeah, like showing some projects and stuff like that. So I'm on Instagram as well. Um, it's good. It's good. All right. Well, uh, listen. Really appreciate your time, Mark. Know you're a busy guy. Uh, you're that busy that you don't even walk your own dog, which is like. I'm not gonna let you away. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let you away with that one. And uh, thanks very much for being on the podcast. And I think listeners will get loads of value from it. So I appreciate it. I just say one thing, mate. Um, brilliant! This your podcast, with Stephen. Absolutely brilliant. Massive fan. Listen to it every week. And um, for him as well. It's just yeah, you're doing absolutely brilliant. So well oh, you're bringing a tear to a glass eye, mate. <laughs> Cheers and see you later. Bye-bye.